Friday morning. Uh, I will uh, finish today some things, and probably tomorrow, I don't know how far I will go today. Tomorrow, maybe I will finish what I want to do today, and then we'll do some, uh, maybe some exercises tomorrow, some, uh, uh, to pr some practice to prepare for the exam. Is there any question about uh, what happened yesterday? I have an, an old question. Okay. And any question? Later. Okay. Uh, okay. So, yeah, put, write down all the questions you have and we'll uh, go through all of them uh, either at the end uh, or sometime today or tomorrow. And. Uh, so now, if you have any question about the last uh, course, so let me remember <coughs> where we were. So what uh, I showed last time is that you can write a field theory for uh, systems of charged ions and the whole <coughs> point was that uh, if I have a system of ions the grand partition function of the system can be written in terms of a particle as an integral uh, sum over n equals zero to infinity lambda to the n over factorial n integral product over i dri and e to the minus beta over 2 uh, sum over i and j uh, qi uh, q qj I mean okay plus etc minus uh, beta minus the interaction with the with the fixed charges, etc. Right? So, what we showed is that um, what we showed is that you can formulate this Z of lambda exactly as a functional integral over all configurations of the field phi. So phi of r is a real field defined at each point in space. And you have e to the minus beta epsilon over 2 integral gradient phi square d3r. So uh, if, there is, uh, if there is fixed charges here, you would have minus beta sum over i integral dr of qi vc of r i minus r rho f of r and then <coughs> uh, minus beta over 2 integral dr dr prime rho f of r vc of r minus r prime rho f of r prime so this is the all the electrostatic energy of the system and the action which comes in here is minus i beta integral d3 r rho f of r phi of r. And if you have several species with fugacity lambda i, so this was what for one species, but uh, believe me, you can easily show it's just the notation is a bit uh, cumbersome. So it's lambda i integral d3 r e to the minus i q i i beta q i phi of r. And this is an exact uh, correspondence. Uh, this exact correspondence was uh, obtained by making a change of variable 
by introducing in here a new variable rho of r equals rho f of r plus sum over i of qi delta of r minus ri. And uh, introducing, enforcing this new variable rho of r by a delta function and the field phi of r is the conjugate field to rho. So what I showed you is that the electrostatic potential uh, let's call it psi of r psi of r is the expectation value of the field i phi of r uh, expectation value being defined with this uh, functional integral. What I showed also is that if you look at the concentration, the concentration of ions of type I, so Ci of R is equal to lambda I expectation value of e to the minus i beta qi phi of r. Is it uh, clear? I think this is uh, up to where I went yesterday. If I am ring if I remember correctly. Okay. And of course, uh, one important thing I, I need to say is that lambda i is uh, lam lambda, no, sorry. Lam the lambda i's, the fugacities lambda i, which are defined here, are defined in such a way that the bulk the total number of particles of type i is equal to lambda i d by d lambda i of log z of all the lambda i. This comes from here, right? And uh, which means if you remember that z of lambda i equals e to the minus beta f of the lambda i. If you divide by V, the volume, you have this relation, which is that Ci equals minus lambda i d by d lambda i of beta f over V. Right? So this is an important relation which will determine lambda i. Okay, uh, Okay. so how do we calculate now uh, this kind of object? And the standard method in, uh, so when you do field theory, there are many methods to, to calculate things. One of the standard approach is uh, perturbation theory. So perturbation theory is, uh, as you know, when you have, so first of all, as a preliminary, the only field theories that you can do, that you can calculate exactly, which means the only functional integrals that you can calculate are the Gaussian ones. Yes? What? But, uh, in the grand, this is the grand potential, or yeah. the grand potential yes. function. Then uh, its logarithm is not the free energy. No, but I call it free energy. It's the <laughs> it's a grand potential, I agree. But uh, for some reason, people note it F, uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, omega in principle. This is the, the, the other free energy, the G1. Uh, it's omega. No, no. Uh, when F flips the, the, the Gibbs free energy. Isn't no, Gibbs free energy, I think, is when you, uh, when you subtract the pressure. It's one is at f fixed volume, one is at, f at fixed pressure. So anyway, it's a notation, who cares? I decided to call it F. It's my, my free, we are in a free country, so I, 
I choose F. Uh, it's not, uh, it's the grand, pot it's a grand potential. I, I think usually you, the notation, it's not the Gibbs, no. I think, well, you know, there is, okay. The internal energy is U. And then you have the enthalpy H, which is U uh, plus PV. Then from U is a function, if you look in terms of, uh, of variables, U is a function of S and V. U is a function of the entropy. If you make a Legendre transform from U to go to temperature, then you go to F of T and V. Now H, this is a Legendre transform when you add PV, and H is a function of S and P. It's a function of the pressure. And from H, you go to G of T and P, and G is the Gibbs free energy, as far as I remember my old thermodynamics. And then when you go, so in fact, F is a function of T, V, and N. N is the number of particles. Yes, you have a question? Okay, so just if you define F uh, minus mu N, so if you go from F to F, you do a Legendre transform where you write F of T V N minus mu N. And I think this is omega, no? Omega is the other one maybe. Okay, it's, it's, it's a different name. But then this gives a function which is a function of T, V, and mu. It's an, another function. Maybe I'm mixing up the symbols, uh, okay. Anyway, you go from one to the other by a Legendre transform. I didn't explain what's a Legendre transform, but I guess you have seen that uh, in high school. Yes? So, you have that defines the lambda and the lambda This equation, yes? Which, uh, or equivalently, this one. Okay. But, uh, so, we are in a grand canonical example. So, the Ni are not fixed, right? No, that's the average Ni. Okay. Yes. So, but what you fix, you, so you have a system which exchanges particle with the, so for instance, when you have a bath of, of uh, salt, what is fixed is the average concentration of the salt. So, the system can exchange ions with the reservoir. And what is fixed is the average Ni. So when, when you are in a grand canonical ensemble like this, what is fixed is the chemical potential, or the fugacity of the ions, so which is the same as the chemical potential, right? Lambda i's are related to the chemical potential like this. So the lambda i's are fixed, but the n can fluctuate, but uh, there is, they have a certain average, which is usually fixed and then they have fluctuations and one can calculate the fluctuations, but usually the fluctuations are in square root, so they, they, they are very small when in, uh, in the thermodynamic limit. Okay, so uh, several approximations are possible, uh, so ways of calculation. So the first one is perturbation theory. If you, so if your theory is not Gaussian, which is uh, in any realistic system, the, your theory is not Gaussian. So if your theory is not Gaussian, which means quadratic in the fields, uh, then you have to do approximations to calculate things. So one of the approximation, one of the possible approximation is uh, perturbation theory. So perturbation theory is when the, if you have the, let me call this the Hamiltonian in this. So if you have H equals H0 plus G H1, if the Hamiltonian can be written as a quadratic part or a Gaussian part plus G times kind of interaction, non-Gaussian part. If G is small, you can do an expansion of all quantities in powers of G. And this is perturbation theory. Now, uh, in this case, there is no a priori small parameter. 
And the way to do is to do uh, what is called the saddle point ap approximation or the loop expansion. And this is what I will start to discuss here. about uh, loop expansion, saddle point approximation. Yes, oh, everybody knows. Okay, so I will review it rapidly. Uh, it's very good, <laughs> excellent. Okay, so the loop expansion or the saddle point approximation is an approximation when you have an integral like this, let's say. Consider, I'll do it for one dimension, integral dx e to the minus l f of x. Uh, yes. So, of course, this, as it is written here, it's not a one-dimensional integral, it's a multi-dimensional, infinite-dimensional integral, but the method is really the same. So, essentially, what you want to know is what happens when L goes to infinity. So, when L goes to infinity, if your function e to the minus L f of x can look something like this, I don't know, it goes to zero at infinity. When L becomes larger, the relative weight of the various, uh, of the various uh, minima are, you see, let's say if you have a maximum, which means a minimum of F at some point, it's going to be more and more dominant because the, the correction of the, okay. So, let me, uh, do it in the following way. The, I, I will explain the way to do it and then I will explain uh, what is the idea behind. So first you look for the minimum of f of x. So call it x0. So f x0 is such that df by dx at x0 equals 0. So it's one of these points. where the function, uh, sorry, it's the function f of x, it's a minimum. I, I plotted the, here the exponential. So the minimum uh, would be something like, uh, I don't know, so it can be, let's say, this point, for instance. So then uh, what you do is you expand f of x around this point x0. So if you expand f of x around f, so it's f of x equals f of x zero. So I'll write it f zero, right? When I put an index zero, means that the function or the derivatives, everything is calculated at zero. Then there is a term plus x minus x zero f prime zero. But this term doesn't exist because you are at the minimum of the function. So this is zero. Then you have plus one half f second zero x minus x zero square. And let me write the next one. F one, two, three over six x minus x zero cube plus etc. So now if I rewrite the integral i of l, and I replace f of x by this expansion around x0 in here. So the first term, there is a first term which comes out, which is e to the minus l f0. And then uh, let me call x minus x0, let me call it uh, u. So then it's integral du of 
e to the minus one half f second zero u square times L minus L and the rest is sum n equal three to infinity f n zero over factorial n u to the n. Right, this is uh, the generic part here. And of course, because uh, I assume that we are at a minimum of f of x, uh, this implies that f second zero is positive. Okay, let's say positive. So this term is really like this, concave, the convex. Yes. Okay, so then I do a rescaling and I will write uh, z equals square root equals u square root of l f second zero. So then this will be equal to e to the minus l f zero. So du will be integral dz divided by square root of L F second zero. And then here I will have E to the minus Z square over two. That, right, the change of variable, the rescaling was done in such a way that I get Z square over two. And then minus L minus, I'll write it as sum n equal three to infinity, uh, f second, f n zero over factorial n, and u to the n is z to the n over f second zero to the n over two, and here I have a factor L, so there is a factor L, minus n of one minus n over two. And now if I look at the expansion when L goes to infinity, so I am in this doing this kind of expansion. So if L goes to infinity, you see that the terms which are here, since n is larger than three, they go to zero. So I can do an expansion I can expand this in powers of one over, so this is really powers of one over square root of L because it, it starts for n equals three. It's one minus three halves, so it's one over square root of L. The next order term will, so if I write the first uh, terms here in this expansion, so the, the term of order zero is E, it will be E to the minus Z square over two minus one over square root of L um, f zero of order three by f second zero to the three half z cube minus etc. The next one will be minus one over l f zero of order four, and uh, I forgot the factor of six, and here will be twenty four etc. And this is to be integrated dz. So then what I'm just saying is that when L goes to infinity, I can re-expand this in powers of L. And this is just e to the minus z square over two times one minus one over square root of L, etc. You do the expansion of all the rest, order by order in powers of one over square root of L. And that will give you an expansion of i of L in the form, so I of L finally will be e to the minus L F zero divided by square root of L F second zero times, 
So the integral of e to the minus z square over 2, it's a square root of pi. So, uh, so it's going to be 1 minus something divided by square root of l plus minus or plus something of order 1 over l plus etc. So if you do this kind of expansion, you have the dominant term. And this I can re-exponentiate because lamb L goes to infinity, so the 1 over square root of L goes to 0. So this goes like e to the minus L F0. Then there is minus 1 half log L, which is this 1 over square root of L. Then there is a term minus 1 half log F second 0. And then there, are, if I re-expand this, I get plus order 1 over square root of L plus all the other terms. of. So this is really an expansion. It's an in asymptotic expansion. So what's interesting is, of course, that I of L is like a partition function. It's an integral. What you're interested in is always the log of the partition function, which is the free energy. So when you take the log of I of L, this saddle point method gives you automatically an expansion, an asymptotic expansion for the free energy in the powers of L for large L. So the dominant term will be proportional to L. Then there is a trivial correction which, which doesn't depend on anything which is log L. But then you have a constant term. So there is a dominant term of order L, then a constant term, and then uh, corrections of order 1 over square root of L, which you can expand to any order you want by uh, some kind of uh, perturbation theory. Yes? Yes. This exponential, because L going to infinity, this goes to zero. So all these terms become small when L goes to infinity. So it's 1 minus, uh, OK, F0. to the 3 half z cube. Of course, the integral, so, and then you do the integral. So uh, the next term will be minus 1 over L. But you see, terms of order 1 over L, you get 1 from here, from the first order expansion, and you get 1 from the square of the expansion of this one. So you have two contributions for the term 1 over L. And yes, and then you do the integral over z. But then the integral over z, so this one will give 0 because it's z cubed e to the minus z squared over 2. But now if I take the next, the term of order 1 over L, so there is a term like f 0, 4 over 2, 24, f 0, second square z to the 4. And then there is a term plus 1 over 2, the square of this term, which is of order z to the 6, right? Which comes from the square of this. So now I give you a, a funny result, which is not funny, but it's a, the manifestation of a very important uh, theorem in, uh, for Gaussian integrals, which is called the, the, the weak theorem. And the weak theorem, OK. So I don't know where to write it. I want to keep, OK, this I don't need anymore. And so for this simple case, let me show you, or dx, let's say, e to the minus x squared over 2. So I normalize it. And x, so if, if I take x to some power, if the power is odd, it will give 0. So if I take x to the 2n, this is weak theorem. And uh, the way to do it is the following. I represent this as a vertex with 2n points like this. And then you do all the possible contractions two by two by pairs in all possible ways. 
So this will generate, so this is how you construct Feynman diagrams. Okay, I, I just do it uh, rapidly, but this is weak theorem. So for instance, if I have something like this, this which are numbered one, two, three, four, this will generate this or this. Or even one and three, and so the rule is that this integral here is the number of way you can do complete pairings of this diagram on itself. So, for instance, one, the one here, you have two n minus one. possibilities to pair. So let's say you pair it like this. Then you have 2n minus 2. So you take the next one, you have 2n minus 3, etc. 3, 1. So have you ever heard about weak theorem in uh, field theory? Yes? Yes? Good. So weak theorem tells you that when you have a Gaussian integral, or in the in field theory, if you have a, a Gaussian or a quadratic uh, quadratic action, uh, the expectation value of a product of fields is the sum over all set of complete contractions, pairwise contractions of the operators. Yes. Sorry? Yes. Okay, so it's it's called so it's a minimal point. I will show why it's a saddle point. Saddle point because okay, I'll I'll come to that precisely now. Okay, so just to finish this, once you do this expansion, this simple integral, and in the case of field theory, the weak theorem tells you how to calculate this expectation value of z cubed, z4, z6, etc., to all orders. And uh, um, in the case of field theory, it's a bit more complicated, but uh, given the time, I cannot, uh, I mean, so here z cubed will give zero, z4 will give a factor of three, z6 will give uh, 15. So you can calculate order by order to any order you want, to any precision you want. This integral when L goes to infinity. Okay, so I, I will come to, the, to your question of saddle point in a minute when I will do it for the... So the idea is simple and I will not do it systematically. In principle, we can do it systematically and you can do it for the case of the field theory of charged ions. So what you do... So let me give you some vocabulary. This is called the, the, this is the saddle point value, and it turns out it's called the mean field value. We will see that it corresponds to the mean field in the case of, uh, in the case of uh, field theory. This is the first correction, so this term, which is this one, this is called the quadratic fluctuations. Why is it called the quadratic fluctuations? It's because it comes from this term. It comes from the integral of this term. And then all the rest, all these corrections are higher order loop corrections. So it's one loop. This is one loop. When it's one over L squared, it's two loop, etc. Okay? So this is just vocabulary. Yeah, you had a question, yes? So I have a confusion for the when you define the variable z. When I define what? Variable z. Yes. Then uh, what is sitting inside the square root is it's not prime, which is a negative number? No, it's positive. It's positive because I said it's a, it's a minimum. So if it's a minimum, F0 is, F second is positive. So one has to sum over all the minima to evaluate it. So, okay, so no. Precisely, this is where uh, one point I wanted to say. So if you have two minima, let's say X0 and X prime 0. Okay. So let's assume that uh, you have... So I, I erase all this. The idea is clear, right? You just uh, do the expansion. Okay. So if you have two minima, x0 and x prime 0, 
so for both minima, uh, of course, f prime is zero, such that, let's say, f of x zero is smaller than x prime, uh, than f of x prime zero. Okay? So then, the, as we saw, the dominant, okay, I erased it, unfortunately, but up to small corrections, the corresponding expansion would give you here e to the minus l f zero, and here would be e to the minus l f prime, uh, f of x prime zero, okay? Now, if f of x zero is smaller than this, then this is larger than this. So the contribution of this is larger than this. Not only that, but if I look at the ratio of the two, so the ratio, so I, so if you want, when L goes to infinity, if I expanded around here, I would get e to the minus L F zero. And this, if I expanded around here, I would get e to the minus L F of X prime zero. If I look at the ratio of these two numbers, the ratio is e to the minus L F zero minus F of X prime zero. And since this is positive, in the limit when L goes to infinity, this goes to zero. So which means that the relative contribution of the other saddle, so you're right, in principle you should write that I of L. I could imagine expanding around X zero and around, uh, I could imagine writing that it's E to the minus L F zero plus E to the minus L F prime, F of X prime zero. <coughs> Etc. But what I'm saying is that the, the dominant one is the one with lowest value of f, because uh, relative to the the other one is exponentially small compared to. So, this will be the major source for the correction. Is it another minima or just the correction around one of the minima? So, if the minima are well separated, you should expand around one minimum and do the correction around minimum one minimum. Now, if what can happen and what happens in many, in quite many situations, not here, but in uh, many problems, it can happen that you have uh, infinite number of minima which are degenerate. In this case, you have to sum over all minima and expand a little bit around each minima and the situation is more complicated. But here we will stick to one minimum and expand around mi one minimum. So is the idea clear? No question? Okay. So the strategy is simple. Look for a minimum or f of the action of this and then expand around it. So we, what we will do is we will expand just to quadratic order. In other words, we will write, we will look. What we will do So I will write, <coughs> I will look for phi zero, which is a minimum of this function, right? So first of all, I will write it, I will introduce a fake parameter L. So write Z, I forget the lambda I, so Z of L is integral d phi e to the minus L times beta epsilon over two integral gradient phi square dr plus I beta integral dr rho f phi minus sum over I lambda I integral dr e to the minus I beta qi Okay, so I just put the L in front and I will do like if L goes to infinity, like if L is very large. Okay, um, so first thing to do is to look for the minimum phi zero. So this is in a functional integral 
it's always of the form exponential of something, and the something is uh, called the action. Okay, so this action, which I can call S or F of five. So the first thing to do is to write, to look for phi zero of R such that delta F of phi zero by delta phi zero of R equal zero. Yes? No, but L is not the length. L is just, it's just a parameter. It's an artificial parameter, which I will imagine that it is large. And at the end, I will put L equals one. Because the, the real quantity, the, that's the real thing that you want to calculate. Now I want to do an, exp so by the way, I didn't comment what, <coughs> what, uh, what is the physical meaning of this uh, saddle point expansion or of this, uh, kind of thing, the meaning is that you look for the, so this is like a probability, right, in the partition function, because you remember that the Boltzmann weight would be, um, the Boltzmann weight is just e to the minus the Boltzmann weight is just e to the minus l f of x divided by i of l, I could have called it z, Z. So you see that the Boltzmann way, that's the probability, the probability to find a particle at point X. You see that if I use the expansion that I was showing, this means that the, the Boltzmann weight has a form typically e to the minus L. So this is F zero, e to the minus L over two X minus X zero square and divided by, uh, so it turns out that this is uh, e to the minus L F zero, and then it's a uh, square root of two pi, sorry, there is F second zero. So these two disappear. So you see that when you do this kind of approximation, it means that you assume that X is going to fluctuate around the mean, the maximum value and at x equal x zero it's x equal x zero is really the value for which the probability is highest which means it's the most probable value of x so here if we do this kind of approach the phi zero that you will get is the configuration of field which has the highest probability to be seen so it's the it's the right if we minimize then you see that the Boltzmann weight of the field that you will get is maximal, so it's the most probable field. That's the whole idea of this uh, saddle point method. It's like in perturbation theory. When you do perturbation theory, it's, it's a parameter of expansion. So you do a formal expansion. It's like if you do a series, you do a series of you, you take, uh, you write exponential x equals one plus x plus x squared over two, etc. When you do this, you, as, you assume that x is small. But in the end, you can put x equal whatever number you want. If you want to calculate, if you want an approximation to e to the x, you can, you can calculate this with x equal one. But the expansion is an expansion which is valid in principle for small x. That's uh, okay. You got the idea? No? So it's an asymptotic expansion. It's not a power expansion because you have, a, uh, you have, it's not a entire function. It's, it's, a, it's asymptotic. It has no radius of convergence whatsoever or something like that. It's just valid when L goes, to, so it's an expansion when L goes to infinity, you can write as many terms as you want in this expansion. And then once you have written it, it's really like this, you can calculate with any value of L. 
This is a very common in physics. You all these large L, large N, there are all kinds of approximations. All these expansions are done like that, and that's the general philosophy. Okay. So the first thing uh, we do is to try to look for the configurations which will maximize the Boltzmann weight of the system. So the most probable, so the idea is you look for the most probable configuration and then you look at small fluctuations around this configuration. This is exactly what you have here when you do this expansion. X0 is the most probable configuration because if X equals X0, it is like this. And then you have quadratic Gaussian fluctuations around this minimum, okay? So the first thing to do is to calculate the functional derivative of this action uh, with respect to phi. Okay. So, you all remember, uh, so you had a tutorial on uh, functional derivatives. So, if I take the functional derivative of this, so the functional derivative of the first term is minus beta epsilon Laplacian phi. And I call it phi zero. You remember that the functional derivative of uh, gradient phi square is minus Laplacian phi. Right, with a factor of two, so it's two Laplace and phi. If you don't remember, I will do it, but for the moment I will assume that you know it. Then functional derivative here will give plus I beta rho F, because it's a linear term, and then minus sum over I, lambda I, then functional derivative of this with respect to phi, so there is plus I, lam, I beta lambda I QI e to the minus I beta QI phi equals zero. And so I can erase the beta. And so the equation is just minus epsilon Laplacian phi zero equals minus I rho F minus I sum over I lambda I QI okay so it looks uh, it looks like Phi is a purely imaginary field so I will write psi zero equals I phi zero. It's my right, I, I decide to. So if I do this, so which means I multiply this equation by I, then this equation in terms of this field psi zero is minus epsilon Laplacian psi zero <coughs> equals rho F plus sum over I lambda i qi e to the minus i uh, e to the minus beta qi psi okay so this looks identical to the poisson boltzmann equation that we had before that we had derived uh, in the beginning the only difference with the poisson boltzmann is that in Poisson Boltzmann here we had the bulk concentration, here is the fugacity. In original. So we will see how to reconcile this because remember that the lambda i's have to be defined
the lambda i's are defined by the equation c i equals lambda i d by d lambda i of uh, minus beta f over v. But now, as we see, so this z of f, I'll write it as e. So we saw that when you do the expansion, the, this integral scales like e to the l times something. So I write it as e to the minus beta l f. So when I write this uh, expansion, you see that f is a function of l, right? f has an expansion in powers of l when l goes to infinity. And therefore, you see that the lambdas, this is an equation for lambda, so it means that lambda has an expansion in powers of l. Right? Because f is a function of l, you expand it in powers of l. C is a number, it's given. So if you want to satisfy this equation, it means that lambda is a, can be a, So what I'm saying is that f of l will have the form f0 plus 1 over l f1 plus etc. Right? Because as we saw, when you expand by the saddle point method, the free energy has an expansion in powers of 1 over L. So if you put this in here, it means necessarily that you will have lambda I equals lambda I 0 plus 1 over L lambda I 1 plus etc. And all this is to be determined. You have to make this equation exact order by order in powers of 1 over L. So what we will show, and it's fairly trivial, is that to order zero. So in this equation, you have to write this equation, then you calculate f at order zero, and this will give you that the lambda i, so the lambda i which should come here because you are at order zero in powers of L, the lambda i zero is just equal to c i, the concentration the bulk concentration of the system. I will show you that in a minute. But so the idea is that everything is expanded to a certain order in 1 over L, and you have to be consistent in all the orders in 1 over L in the expansion. OK? Yes? Yes, because, no, I'll come back to this. It's just, uh, yes, so when you have, um, okay, first of all, let me show you one thing. Uh, when you have, uh, when you do the subtle point, and this is where the, so it's related to this question of subtle point. So in principle, we saw that what you're doing is that you're, in, you're integrating i of l uh, along from minus infinity to plus infinity, say, e to the minus l uh, f of x. Now, if you find, uh, OK, so the integral is like this. Now assume that everything goes to infinity, to zero at infinity, and uh, everything is well behaved. So then you know that you can deform the contour of integration as you want in the complex plane, as long as you don't cross any pole of the function f of x. As long as you don't cross any singularity of the function f of x, you can go wherever you want. And now, of course, if you have a saddle point which is somewhere in the complex plane, it's perfectly legal to deform your contour and do the expansion around this point because if you do this, uh, if you get a better saddle point, which means a better minimum of the function, a better extremum of the function along this path, then it will be a better approximation to, to this integral. So what I am saying is that I call it saddle point, and it is because, essentially, the saddle point that you choose 
seems to tell you that it's not on the real axis, but there is a, because on the real axis, you will not find any solution. There is no minimum of this. But if you deform the phi's and allow them to go in the complex plane, you find that there is one saddle point which is purely imaginary here. And now it's called a saddle point because you know that when you have a function, a complex function in, in the plane, uh, it cannot have a minimum. If it's an analytic function, it cannot have a minimum. It can only have saddle points, right? That's why it's called the saddle point function, uh, saddle point method. And in principle, what you're supposed to do is, you know, when you have a saddle point like this, you look at the second derivatives and you have regions, two perpendicular regions. In certain areas, the function increases. And in other areas, the function is bound. So this, in this region, the function increases. And in, in this region, it's a maximum. And this dictates the, the way the path is. If you, had, uh, if you have a saddle point like this, you're not allowed to go through it because you would have to go over large regions to, to join back, uh, to go back to infinity. Because the, the path has to be fixed at infinity. So you can deform it like this. Is it uh, clear? More or less? <coughs> right, you, you have a path from minus infinity to plus infinity you can deform it in the complex plane as long as you don't hit any singularities of the function. And uh, you can select any saddle point provided it has this shape, namely that it allows you to, to go back to infinity while not going to, while not increasing, right? If you have a saddle point like this, it, if you go through it, if you cross here, it's increasing, right? The, a saddle point, it's a, it looks like a paraboloid. It's, it's like this. So if you follow this direction, you go up, and you cannot satisfy that you go to zero. So in other words, this is it. And here you can look and you can show that the saddle point phi zero, so it's the saddle point, it's not the integral, is pure imaginary. And therefore, that's how you get this equation. Is it uh, approximately, yes? Sorry, can you talk a little bit uh, lower because I cannot hear her. Yes, why not? You mean for this equation or in general? Well, the saddle point approximation is just looking which part, which field here gives you the, max, the most contribution, the biggest contribution to this integral. Uh, that so. specific point is just in uh, imaginary axis. It turns out that in this case, it's on the imaginary axis, but it could be in the real axis. It could, you don't, I mean, if I give you, uh, there are some cases, so in this case, it's pure imaginary axis. But in some cases, it can be in the complex plane or it can be on the real axis. It depends. If it's on the real axis, in general, you don't have to move your, your contour. You don't have to do, you just take it as it is. In this case, it turns out that you have to do this change. And this change is okay because it shows then that the electrostatic potential, if you remember, I erased it, but it was there the electrostatic potential psi i is the expectation value of i phi i. I uh, sorry, not phi i. Psi of r is the expectation value of i phi of r. That's what I showed last time. And it turns out that when you are at the saddle point approximation, so i of l, we saw that the P of x in the saddle point approximation goes like e to the minus one half x minus x zero square 
over uh, times f second. Zero divided by square root of two pi f second zero. And there is a factor of L. So if you calculate expectation value of X at this approximation level, it's just X zero. But you just do the integral, you shift X by X zero and the, the rest of the integral, right? If I calculate integral dx, x, p of x. Of course, if I go to higher order in L, I will have corrections. But at this order, this is just uh, integral. So I write x minus x0 equals u. So it's integral du of x0 plus u. Uh, and then e to the minus L over 2 u square f second 0 divided by this. So the first term is x0, which is a constant. And the second one is 0. So which means that at the saddle point approximation, the expectation value of any quantity is equal to the value at the saddle point. So expectation value of i phi of r in the saddle point approximation is just i phi 0, where phi 0 is the saddle point. Yes? F, ah, yes, yes, so yes, yes. It's just to confuse you a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, otherwise it's, uh, it's too simple. Okay, uh, you very fast, you run out of uh, notations. Very often people call this S, S as uh, action, probably. Okay, I don't know. Uh, we can call it, uh, call, let's call it S of phi. Or, okay, let me call it, keep F because you wrote already F. So, I mean, there shouldn't be too many ambiguities. Actually, you see that at the saddle point, these two will be the same, right? Because F of, at phi zero, will be the free energy at the lowest order. Right, to, to lowest order, if you remember, it's f of x0 the, at the value. So f of phi 0 is really the f at lowest order. So it's not exactly completely stupid. It's just a little bit stupid. Um, OK, so this is the equation. OK, so essentially, you have what happens is that the Poisson-Boltzmann equation and the Poisson-Boltzmann uh, electrostatic potential appears to be the configuration of the field which has maximal contribution to the free energy to the Boltzmann weight. So it's the contribution which is uh, dominant, let's say. In and then what you want to do is to look for fluctuations around this dominant configuration. Okay. Uh, let me just do one more thing. And then I will give examples. Uh, the one more thing is that uh, let's do a case, for instance, assume that there is no external charges. So it's just a bulk solution of ion. Example. Take rho f equals zero. It's a bulk electrolyte. So an electrolyte is just a solution of ions of all kinds, uh, whatever you want. So if rho f is equal to zero, <coughs> right? Then the solution is psi zero equals zero. No protest. Okay. You just put it in. So in fact, what you get is a zero equals sum over i, <coughs> lambda i q i. And because of charge neutrality, sum over i of lambda i q i is zero. So if you have charge neutrality, 
which you always have, and if you have no rho f, the solution is psi zero equals zero. So if psi zero is equal to zero, which means phi zero is phi zero equals zero, if I look here, you see that z, so to lowest order, will be equal to, so this is zero, <coughs> this is zero, and then I have just e to the lambda sum over i, uh, sorry, e to the l sum over i lambda i times v plus corrections if I had done the expansion to higher order. But here, right? Yes? Yes. No, no. X zero, the, the, what plays the role of X zero is psi zero. Initially, I had this integral dx e to the minus l f of x. So this is integral d phi of x, phi of r, e to the minus l f of phi. So looking for a minimum x zero is equivalent to looking for phi zero. So phi zero is the saddle point. It's not a point, it's not the x zero. It's, it's a function which it's a function which minimizes the f of phi. So I'm looking for this function which will give you the maximal weight here. Is it clear? So, so then the, the point is that this you expand as e to the minus l f of phi zero plus some correction which I will calculate after. But the lowest to lowest order in plus correction of order one over L. So there is a, a, a correction of order one plus etc. So I will in this class I will calculate the F of phi zero and the F one. So what I'm saying is that the F of the F zero or F of phi zero is just F where you replace phi zero by its value at the saddle point. So the, the value at the saddle point is zero, you plug phi zero equals zero here, so this is zero, there was no external field, so you get this, and this is the integral of r when phi is equal to zero, it's just the volume. So this is what you get, and therefore you see that beta f, and this z of l is e to the minus beta L f of L. So this tells you that to order zero, f zero, beta f zero of L, so beta f zero, it's the order, is equal to minus sum over i lambda i times v. And therefore you see that the equation for the particle number this equation to all, yes? Uh, can we repeat why we take the uh, solution of the Poisson equation there, the phi was equal to zero, and not another one that gives the second derivative equal to zero? The second the what? I mean, because if you assume that uh, uh, rho is zero, yes. and then the sum over the other species is zero k, yes. but then there's the second derivative of phi is zero, right? Not, not phi is equal to zero. No, I don't. I don't. Sorry? So the, this equation, if I put zero here, yeah. I, just sat, I just verify, I just check that if I put psi zero equals zero, it works. Yeah. No? So what, what else do you want? Uh, but we have uh, the equation that says that the second derivative of a function is zero, right? So why we assume The second derivative? On, on the left of, the, of this equation, there's second derivative, right? The Laplacian. Yes, okay. but so the Laplacian is zero. If, if, phi zero, if psi is zero, the, the Laplacian is zero. Yeah, but it's not the only solution. So I don't understand if you are starting assuming rho f equals zero or phi equals zero. No, I assume rho f equals zero. So there are no external charges. Okay. So it's just a bulk solution of ions. Yeah. So if I have a bulk solution of ions, without by just translational invariance, I can assume I can be sure that psi is going to be independent of r in space, right? 
Yes. If, if there, is, there is no breaking of uh, translational symmetry in the system, if I don't have fixed charges, everything is translationally invariant. So psi should be independent of R. So Laplacian of psi will be zero. And then because of uh, invariance, so psi equals zero is a, actually psi can be any value you want, any constant works, yeah, okay. right? Because if I have any constant, this will give me zero. And this, if it's a constant, it comes out. No, it doesn't work because of the QI. So it has to be zero. Right? Because of uh, yeah, okay. translational invariance, psi is constant. And because of this, the only solution is psi zero equals zero. Okay. Thanks. Sorry? I didn't how, came out. how what? How, how the volume came out. Oh, the volume, because. Look here, I have integrals everywhere. So if I put phi equals zero, so this term, if I put phi equals zero, doesn't contribute. There was no rho f. So here I have integral dr of one. That's the volume. Why in general we assume that lambda is a function of L? Yes. And as a result, f phi zero would be a function of L. Absolutely. So what I'm saying is that the, from this analogy, the order, when I, you see, when I was doing this integral, the, the expansion was the order zero of f of, so if, if this is i of l, if you want, was l f of x zero. So the lowest order term is f the value of the function take at the saddle point? So the value of the function taken at the saddle point, that's this. So what I'm saying is that at lowest order, this is e to the minus beta l times f0 plus 1 over l f1 plus etc. It will be like that. So what I'm saying is that l0, uh, f0 is given by this. And furthermore, it will be the value of lambda i zero because lambda itself will depend on L. Um, I'm not sure we can see that today. So maybe in the beginning next time. But the lambda, <coughs> since lambda is determined by uh, this equation, if we expand F in powers of one over L, the lambdas have to be expanded also in powers of one over L so as to satisfy this equation, which doesn't depend on L. So they have to be adjusted order by order in powers of one over L. It's a little bit like a renormalization group, in fact, where you request that certain quantities are independent of the cutoff or things like that. It's exactly the same procedure. Okay, I is it clear or more or less? I mean, it, it's not, uh, it, it's, uh, it's rigorous. I mean, it's, it's not uh, just vague. It's really, if you, if you write an expansion of F, well, actually the strategy would be the following. You, you do an expansion of, you, you give yourself a certain lambda and you do an expansion of F as a function of lambda. So F would be F zero, uh, not as a function of lambda, as a function of L. So plus one over L, F1 plus 1 over L square, F2, etc., with fixed lambda. And then I say that I should have Ci equals lambda I d by d lambda I of minus beta F0 plus F1 over L plus etc., divided by V. So you see that this will give you a function of lambda which depends on L, and you can re-expand the lambdas as a function of L, and you will have an expansion in lambda as a function, as function of L like this. Right? Yes? Yes. Yes. 
Yes, so, so I, I was going to do it here. So by, by doing this, by replacing, I get that beta F0 is minus lambda IV, which is just this term, right? Because I put phi equals zero. So I get minus sum over I lambda I times V. So then I do uh, lambda I D by D lambda I of minus. So I get that CI at this order, I should have CI equals lambda I D by D lambda I of minus beta F over V and minus beta F over V is sum over I of lambda I and sum over I, like the derivative is one, so you get really this. Exactly. Is, is this true every time? So, okay. So if rho f is not equal to zero, if rho f is localized in a certain space, you can, so if you look asymptotically very far from rho f, and if rho f, so rho f has to be finite. So, so the, the distribution, it's always the same. Uh, it was like the question of the normalization. If, so if you have rho f, which is a finite, object, if you have charge neutrality, then at large distances, phi go to zero, so you solve this equation asymptotically at large distances, and you will see that at large distances, psi go to zero, and then when you plug it back here, you see that the region where psi is non-zero, you see, when you have a neutral solution, a, a solution which is a electrostatic charge neutral, and you have finite charged object, then you have a Debye length, and the field everywhere, the electrostatic potential will be non-zero only up to a certain distance, <coughs> lambda d, Debye length, around there. Beyond that, essentially, the field goes to zero exponentially fast. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, now in case, of course, in the case where uh, the charges rho f are not zero, you have to solve the full uh, Poisson-Boltzmann equation, and that's it. Uh, one thing I forgot to show you is one example uh, what happens in the case in the case of a one one salt so one one salt you have two uh, you have plus and minus components symmetric so the partition function z is if i the is integral dA, d phi, e to the minus beta epsilon over two integral gradient phi square minus I beta integral rho f phi dr. And then here, if I have a salt, so the two components will have the same chemical potential because of charge neutrality. So you will have lambda integral d3r e to the minus i beta q phi plus e to the plus i beta q phi. When q equals e or whatever. So this is just two cosine. Just to mention that this is, this is a uh, very common field theory, which is called the sine gordon field theory. If you have no external potential, but it doesn't matter, this is a source field. So this is called sine gordon. And the sine gordon uh, theory is uh, very well known and very uh, studied uh, particularly because in two dimensions it's an integrable system and it has uh, exact solutions. 
complete exact solutions in two dimensions, but not in three. Okay, I don't know if you have ever studied or heard about sine gordon theory, but. Okay. So once we have the, and by the way, uh, if you write the, <coughs> the saddle point, yes? Because, uh, because in 2D, this operator is marginal. The anomalous dimension is zero, so, I mean, the canonical dimension is zero, so it's, it's complicated too. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes, so now, uh, once you have done the mean field, the uh, average, so it's called mean field because it, in fact, it's not a mean field, it's the most probable solution. So you replace the whole integral by the integral by the value at one field. So now let's look what happens for the fluctuations. Okay? So the fluctuations, and it is called the quadratic fluctuations. So I will write back the equation here. So it's minus epsilon Laplacian size zero equals rho f plus sum over i. So at this, uh, so lambda i q i and psi zero equals i phi zero. Okay. So the next step, so the partition function z of L, as we saw, is an integral d phi of e to the minus L minus beta. Oh, so let me, okay, I call this was, this was f, no, I don't remember, was it f of phi? So let, let me call it s of phi because it's, uh, no, because of the beta, I, I didn't. Re I don't want to put the beta. Okay, it's just to confuse you a little bit. Uh, so it's e to the minus l s of phi. So now what I want to do is expand around phi zero. So I write phi equal phi zero plus. And if you remember, I made a change of variable because in the integral i of l. It was integral e to the minus l f of x zero plus l times x minus x, so sorry, minus l x zero square over two f second zero. So the variable really should be, I want to define u equals x equal, equals square root of l x minus x zero. I want to include the square root of L here so that the expansion is more natural. So I will write phi equal phi zero plus a certain field psi divided by square root of L. Okay, it's my, uh, my choice. So, and I will do the expansion. In principle, you're supposed to do it to any order, but then uh, the calculations are more and more complicated. So I will do it to second order. To second order, I write that S of phi is equal to S of phi zero plus psi over square root of L. And I do the functional expansion to order two. So it will be S of x zero plus one over square root, uh, S of phi zero, sorry, plus one over square root of L integral dr psi of r delta s by delta phi zero of r plus one over two l integral dr dr prime psi of r delta two s 
by delta x phi zero of r, delta phi zero of r prime, psi of r prime, plus, etc. Uh, do you understand this uh, expansion, this kind of expansion? This is the generalization of Taylor expansion for function. It's a functional Taylor expansion, right? So it's like when you have, if you have a function S of many fields, phi 1, phi n, which are the values of the field phi 0 at all the point in space, you see it's the value at the point here plus sum over i of phi d by d phi i, etc. So this is really the simple generalization of the expansion of a function around a certain field phi zero. So it's phi zero of r, of course, plus psi of r. And psi of r is called the fluctuation field, yes? Uh, where did I put it? I didn't put one yet. Uh, where so did I? We artificially add this L and at the end we treat it as No, at the end when, uh, when you want to evaluate quantities and compare with uh, and see what is the value, what is the approximate value of the quantity, you put L equals one. It's when you, so I do the expansion in powers of L to any order and then if I want to see the approximation to see actual values, if I want to calculate really the free energy, at that point I have to put L equals one. But I, I don't, I mean, it's an expansion. It's like uh, if I expand a function, I, I can calculate all the coefficients one after one. And at the end, if I want to calculate the function at x equals one, at the end I will put x equals one. But to calculate things, uh, you see what I, yes? This one? Yes, it's, you, it's, you, in this kind of writing, you have to imagine R, it's like an index. Okay, forget the phi zero. See, this, this is what, you see, phi of R is really like the value of phi d phi, if you, if you had a discretized if the space was discretized, phi of r is really phi, it's the collection phi at point one, at point two, phi at all points on the lattice. That's what means phi of r. It's a field, so a field is defined by the value of the function at all points in space. So you can imagine you have a lattice, something like that. Now, if I have a function s, which is a function of phi one, phi n, which is the equivalent of this phi of r. If I want to expand around some phi zero, I will write that it's phi one zero plus psi one, phi two zero plus psi two, right? If I have a certain configuration of my field, it will correspond to phi one zero, phi two zero, phi n zero. This is my field phi zero. It's defined in each point of space. So I have this, so then this is like a function of many variables and I do just a Taylor expansion. So the first term will be S of phi one zero, uh, phi two zero, etc. Plus sum over I of psi I ds by del d phi I zero, which is exactly this term. So the sums become integrals. And then the cross, the second order term will be the cross term sum over i and j of psi i d2s by d phi i zero, d phi j zero, psi j, etc. Okay? And then of course you, and you replace all the sums by integrals. Yes? Sorry, can you? Yes. 
it's the same. I mean, you do the functional derivative with respect to phi and you replace by phi zero, or you replace first by phi zero and you take the, it's, it's the same. Yes, so you choose it, you, so, so in principle, you take S of phi, you do the derivative, and you put phi zero. Okay. Yeah, um, but or, or, you, or you write it as a function of phi zero, you do the derivative, and then, uh, and then you implement uh, phi zero. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's the same, really. So the only important thing is that this quantity is zero. This quantity is zero because the phi zero, by definition, is the field which minimizes the action S of phi, right? That's how we construct phi zero, is the one which minimizes S of phi. So S of phi is equal to S of phi zero plus one over two L integral dr, dr prime, Psi of R delta to S by delta phi of R delta phi of R prime psi of R prime plus etc. Actually, yes. Why what? It is because by definition, by definition, phi zero is the field which minimizes the action. That's how it is constructed. So delta S by delta phi zero is by definition zero. That's how we choose it, right? So actually, instead of doing all these uh, second derivatives things and etc. I can write directly that Z of L, if I make the change of variable that I was think, saying, which is here. So it's integral D. So I write it as integral D psi now, because I have this change of variable. So obviously this is a constant. It's just uh, like a shift X zero. So from this, I have D phi equals D psi. Right, it's like a normal integral. It's a multi-dimensional, infinitely multi-dimensional integral. So it's integral d psi of e to the minus l times beta epsilon over two integral gradient phi zero plus gradient psi square plus I beta integral dr rho f phi zero plus psi minus sum over I lambda I integral dr e to the minus I beta qi phi zero plus psi. Okay, so I just do the change of variable and then I will expand to second order. Because it will be maybe simpler than uh, Okay. So, this, if I expand this, I have a first term which is gradient phi zero square plus two gradient phi zero gradient psi plus psi square. This is this. Then here I have a term, so beta epsilon over two, integral of this, plus I beta integral rho f phi zero plus psi. And here minus sum over I, lambda i integral dr of, and then here I expand again to second order in psi. So if I expand to second order in psi, I have e to the minus i beta qi 
phi zero times one minus i beta q i psi minus beta square q i square over two psi square. So now what I say is that everything, so because phi zero is the minimum or the extremum of the action, all the terms of order one in psi, the sum of all terms of order one in psi are zero. It's just, just this. Because it's the minimum, so since I have chosen by definition phi zero to be the minimum of, of the extremum of the action, the first order term in psi should be zero. So eventually what one gets is that Z of L is equal to e to the minus. So I will collect the terms in pure phi zero, which are e to the minus L <coughs> times beta epsilon over two integral gradient phi zero square plus I beta integral rho f phi zero minus sum over I lambda I integral dr e to the minus I beta qi phi zero. This is the first term. So the terms in psi are zero. The term linear in psi don't contribute. They are zero. And then I have integral d psi of e to the minus. So uh, actually I made a mistake. It's psi over square root of L. The change of variable, I forgot the square root of L. So here was the square root of L. And here is the square root of L, which means in the expansion I have a square root of L here, uh, L here, square root of L. <laughs> and here square root of L and L, okay? The change of variable is here. So, since there is a factor of L, you see that all the terms which are quadratic in Xi carry a factor one over L, and therefore we have e to the minus L times one over L, so there is no more factor of L. So I have beta epsilon over two integral gradient psi square. This term doesn't count. And then plus sum over I lambda I beta square QI square over two psi square. And this, you recognize something which we saw in the beginning, which is the bihuckel theory. So, Z of L equals E to the minus L beta epsilon over two integral gradient phi zero square plus I beta integral rho F phi zero minus sum over I lambda I integral E to the minus I beta Q I phi. And then integral So this is the in, so this is the contribution of the saddle point. So that's the dominant contribution, and this is the contribution of the quadratic fluctuations around the saddle point, right? It's small fluctuations around the the field phi zero, which, and it's given by integral d psi of e to the minus beta epsilon over two, and you can see that it's just the integral d three r of 
gradient psi square plus kappa d square, psi square, where kappa d square is the de Bayer-Hückel uh, constant given by sum over i of lambda i beta qi square over epsilon. Question? Yes? Uh, I think that where the linear characteristic psi is equal to zero. It's because the when you do the expansion, the coefficient, you do, you write s of phi zero plus psi over square root of L. So the it's an expansion around phi zero. Therefore, the coefficient of psi, of all the psi, of the, the linear part in psi, the coefficient is just delta s by delta phi zero, yeah. which is zero. Uh, then in that term, there is no delta uh, derivative of s respect to phi zero. In which term? Uh, the second term. This one? Uh, I beta integral. No, there is no contribution. No, there is. No, there is. Here? Yeah. But this is linear in psi. So, in fact, it's, it's zero. no, it's not this term is zero. It's the sum of this ter of all the linear term in psi. So the sum. Let me see if I have some. Okay. Uh, okay. The sum of linear term. So you have one linear term in psi here, right? It's a, you have one linear term here, and you have one linear term here. So the sum of all these linear terms in psi, the coefficient of the psi is zero. And you can see that easily. All the uh, coefficients are derivative of uh, action respect to, to phi zero. And you see the coefficient of psi here, if you integrate by part, it will be minus Laplace and phi zero. Here it's rho f, and here it's this. And you see that you recognize it's exactly the coefficient of psi will be minus Laplace and phi zero plus i. Okay, so with some beta, with some epsilon, minus plus i beta rho f, uh, plus or minus uh, plus i beta lambda i e to the minus beta q i phi zero. And this is, by definition, the Poisson-Boltzmann equation that we had. So this is zero. So the coefficient of psi is precisely the equation that you put equal to zero. So you don't have even to worry. By it's, it's like this, because you chose the phi zero so that it minimizes the. OK, so the conclusion for today and, and next time, I don't know what I will do if I really want to do some. Uh... OK, so the conclusion is that when you go to when you do the saddle point for this functional integral, the lowest order term is the Poisson-Boltzmann theory. And the first order, the quadratic correction to Poisson-Boltzmann theory, so the fluctuations are described by a Debye-Huckel theory. This is the Debye-Huckel free energy. And, uh, okay, and next time we will see that this is just e to the minus one half log of the determinant of the operator minus Laplace in square plus kappa d square. Okay, so I will stop for today. So tomorrow I, I will try to maybe sketch the calculation of this quantity and uh, I will try to answer questions. And uh, So if you have questions, prepare questions. If things are not clear,